Are there any elements of this proposal that as a state regulator, the ecology finds concerning? Okay. Thank you all for having me here. Can everyone hear me? Um, so I'm Teresa Howell. I'm with the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, I am the regulatory integration specialist for our office, so I make sure that all of our various sections are implementing uh, regulations appropriately uh, across everything that they touch, essentially. So um, I should start by briefly explaining our role in this uh, year evaluation. So ecology is not a regulatory authority on the order 435.1. Um, that being said, we are developing agency comments, um, and those will be coming before the end of the public comment period. Um, those comments will focus primarily on um, whether we feel that uh, the WEIR evaluation criteria have been met, and also if the 435.1 performance assessment, which is a part of uh, the TPA requirements, the Tri-Party Agreement requirements, has been met. So our expectations uh, as a regulatory agency are that uh, DOE is following TPA appendices H and I, and we will follow on with our uh, more specific comments. So, as Jeff mentioned in his presentation, there are additional documents necessary to support the process, such as a composite analysis and a performance assessment. These are not yet completed, or there are as yet comments to resolve. Why is DOE not waiting until that documentation is complete? The public can have a more comprehensive look at potential impacts before moving forward with the process. Again, I'm Chris Kemp, and uh, I wanted to thank uh, Ken for having us down. Uh, if we didn't have time to say it tonight, thank you, Oregon Department of Energy, for inviting us down. And Jeff, great uh, write up. Um, factual. Um, the draft waste incidental reprocessing evaluation, this document that's out for public review through uh, November 7th, does not rely on a composite analysis. However, the composite analysis, and the Department of Energy has a composite analysis from 2000, along with um, analysis for most needs through a tank closure waste management EIS, environmental impact statement published in 2012 in a record of decision in 2013. Um, we know that we are updating our composite analysis for the Hanford site and it will be drafted and ready for review in uh, February 2020. Will be uh, considered by both uh, DOE, by DOE, uh, before DOE decides whether to authorize the closure of the sea farm uh, tanks or proceeding with other closure actions for the sea farm. Um, the conceptual model of the, the um, landfill cap. <coughs> we, will, we will have a CA but the CA is not required for this particular classification. Maybe not required, but, but still, why not wait until it is out? And, and again, the public can get a look at the entire process, if you will, at one time. Well, again, it's not required. The question is, why not wait? And we encourage, if, if that's a comment from the public, we encourage that to come into the public comment period and do we will have to consider it. Uh, Jeff spoke about contaminated soil beneath the sea tank farms not being considered now. So how will it be considered later? And will and should that include a separate weir for soil? Okay. Uh, this is Sherry Ross from DOE um, headquarters. Um, and this draft weir evaluation, can y'all hear me? Okay, so this draft weir evaluation is limited to the sea tank farm, the operating system, the tanks, the ancillary structures, and any contamination within that weir permit. Um, it does not address the contaminated soils. Um, Radioactive contaminated soils and media will be addressed under CERCLA. Um, it's a different process, it's, it's different analysis, and different decisions. It's not limited to just the Department of Energy. Um, so for this determination, 
um, it's for the operating system and is it appropriate to be managed as low-level waste does not address the soils. Um, it, it would be an excellent comment to the Department of Energy you know, if you feel that needs to be included in that. So there's been a, a bit of confusion uh, over the past few months concerning a where determination DOE made by citation in 2008 for soil and free at Hanford. Uh, this prior where citation includes late tank waste. It's caused some to be concerned that DOE has already performed a where for the soils and for seed farms. So can you clarify this, uh, this confusion? Sure. Uh, the Department of Energy did a where citation um, to allow us to be able to primarily uh, retrieve those tanks. Those tanks had legacy equipment that we had to remove, take out of those tanks and put in, <coughs> excuse me, retrieval equipment. We also, on the unlikely event, if we had a uh, bleed to soil from contamination in the tank farm, we would obviously um, have to dig that up um, for worker protection standpoint there. So um, we call that tank farm operational secondary equipment waste and soils that were removed from active operations. They become managed waste, and because they're managed at that point, i.e. put in a drum or a burial box, they are subject to the provisions of DOE Order 435.1, including the provisions regarding a weird determination. Radio, I want to emphasize radioactive contaminated soils, what I call in situ, soils that have been, um, um, happened from the operational period, primarily 1946 in the case of Sea Farm through the 1980s period, those will be remediated and closed under a separate decision. Right now, it's not been negotiated with the Washington State Department of Ecology but we believe the right way to do that is under CERCLA, but that's not a defined, uh, agreed upon process yet. Teresa, any comment so on this one? Just oh, one more time. So to emphasize, tank farm soils contaminated with radioactive waste from past releases during the operational period will be addressed under that process. This weird determination in 2008 and the one that we're continuing to use right now, it's. It's a ORP procedure or a directive. Does not address those type of events. Teresa, any comment? I know Jeff is. I will just um, reiterate and uh, agree what Chris said there at the end. So um, the soils in uh, Sea Farm are addressed under the Tri-Party Agreement. There is a process in there. Um, that current process is not exclusively CERCLA, and that process would need to be negotiated if we are going to close them exclusively under CERCLA with the regulatory agencies who are party to the Tri-Party Agreement. Does everybody know what CERCLA means? Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's a basically a federal Superfund law, but okay. let's, let's, okay. let's stop it a bit. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jeff, do you have a comment? Uh, Uh, sure, so I wanted to provide a little more, I guess, interpretation of, of what I'm hearing about the, how the 2008 weir works, how the, how the soils work, and how the weir works in relation to it. And it all comes down to when does something become a waste? And what I'm hearing, what I'm reading into what you're saying is that until you either dig up some material from the soil or otherwise prepare it for final disposition. It is not waste, it is just contaminated material that you then address some other way. And because it's not waste, you don't have to ask the question, is it high level waste or low level waste? It's just contaminated material. Is that the general idea? Just really simply. So very specifically talking about soil, because we yeah, use this about soil. soil, okay. I, when I think of this directive, I think of legacy equipment that we have to remove out of tanks. So I will be honest, in 2007, there was a tank waste leak on a retrieval system, a tank S102. Um, we had a, a pump seal fail, 83 gallons of tank waste went to the ground. That had to be dug up. In that circumstance, we had to dig that up. 
If you're talking about digging up material from legacy operations, that we're um, that Office of River Protection Directive, that we're citation does not apply. Hmm. So the, the logical link I then want to make is that if you have waste in soil and you decide to leave it there and you put a cap over it and close it in place forever, there would not be a need to do a waste incidental to reprocessing evaluation to find out, you know, should we call that high level waste, should we call it low level waste. And the reason it's important, and the reason it's important to Oregon is because there are those three criteria. Did you remove key radionuclides to the maximum extent practical? Did you prove that you can meet your performance objectives out that long? And so that's why it's an important piece for us. And we consider it in very simple terms. You know, an apple that falls out of a barrel is still an apple. And so waste that was in a tank and then is no longer in a tank, we consider that it became waste under the definition from Congress as soon as it was material that resulted from the re reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. And so I think that, I just wanted to clarify where the disagreement is be between our parties. Okay. Question four, so the comment deadline on this document that's currently out is November 7th. As we mentioned, there is a, a box you can put comments in tonight. There's also information about submitting comments via email and other, other uh, methods. Uh, the question to you folks, what further opportunities will be, will there be for the public to provide input to this or related process? So how much, how much opportunity does the public get to weigh in? Okay. So the department has not made a decision and we really are looking for comments from the public. Um, the Indian nations, um, regulatory authorities, um, before making a decision. And we will consider those um, when we do make that decision. Um, there are opportunities for the public to, besides this immediate public comment period that is going to end around November the 7th, the DOE um, and NRC's consultation process, we are making that as open to the public as possible. So currently we are having a technical conference call between DOE and NRC staff. We've posted that information on the uh, ORP's Office of River Protection website, and you can listen to those conversations. Um, the documentation between DOE and NRC will be made public. Um, those, those conference calls that we have, we do post a summary of those calls. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will be asking in writing um, a request for additional information from the Department of Energy, and when we receive those, we plan to have a public meeting um, where we ask NRC to explain what they're asking for before DOE then goes and answers. We may run models, do research, and answer those questions. And when we answer those questions, we will have another public meeting where we will explain to NRC those answers. So, um, and then their technical evaluation report will be made available for the public as well. <coughs> now, there are other processes um, where public can provide comments before the department um, can obtain closure. Um, because this waste is mixed waste, it's both hazardous and radioactive, um, there would be a state permit, uh, probably a RECRA permit, and that entire process, issuing that RECRA permit, will be made will be done through a public process. So the, com the public can comment on that closure plan and for the state issues the record permit. That is a requirement that has to happen before DOE can close the tanks. And any circular decision that's also made, we were talking about the circular process, that also is a public process uh, that the public can submit comments on. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity for the public um, to get engaged and provide <coughs> comments to, to not just the Department of Energy, but the other agencies that are a part of this process. So would all those activities have to occur before you could begin routing the tanks? That the is department? correct. And roughly how long a period do um, you expect that to take? We're expecting um, a full 12 months until probably next fall just to complete this decision, the determination of whether we can manage it as well level way. Through the consultation with NRC and considering the public comments that are provided to the department, um, closure is. Chris, I think you said 2020. Right. 
That's almost in the fifth question. Do you want us to address that now? Yes, Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> I'm answering. I'm already, in, I'm already in number five. No, sorry. you're doing good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so the, if the weird determination is approved, what is the expected timeline for grounding the tanks? And um, I have been in, um, in charge of, on DOE's part, retrieval of the sea farm tanks. So I, I talk like an optimistic uh, project person, but if we got the retrieval, uh, or excuse me, the approval from the Washington State Department of Ecology and a record closure, record permit, and the Department of Energy, remember there's radionuclides and hazardous dangerous waste or chemicals in those tanks. Um, do we would like to start um, grounding the 200 serious tanks by 2020? That's a very yeah. optimistic timeline. The reason for that is these tanks are 74 years old. Wow. We believe that um, being protective uh, of the environment and the workers and the public can be achieved by a landfill closure. But I want to emphasize we have to get those approvals before we start grouting, and we do not have that yet. All right, we're about halfway through these. So, uh, Chris, if I could ask you to come up here, our next question is about the role the NRC is playing in this process and how might the review influence the UE's final decision. If you wouldn't mind just uh, being, giving a pretty brief answer on how the NRC factored in all this. Um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission has no regulatory role at Hanford. It has no authority over DOE in these matters. However, can't hear. How? Sorry. Is this not working? No, just a little closer. A little closer. Okay. Um, NRC does not have any regulatory authority or or oversight over Han over Hanford activities. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there was another process that's very similar at Savannah River and Idaho, which is where we do have a law that states that we are involved in the process of, make, of, of overseeing DOE's decision, waste incidental reprocessing decisions, and then monitoring those actual disposal operations for, well, forever. And, but at Hanford, we've been asked to become to provide the same technical consultation to look at their performance assessment and their waste determination in the exact same way as we do for Idaho and South Carolina, to the same level of rigor and review those um, and provide those recommendations to the department for their consideration in making the final waste determination. So they're not bound by your decision, but they've asked for the same rigor in terms of your oversight. Right, they are not a licensee, so they are not bound by our decisions. Okay. Thank you. So question seven, and I know this is for Chris, uh, because I heard him address a little bit this afternoon. Uh, what more from a technology perspective would it take to retrieve additional waste from, as an example, each of the three tanks that have about 10,000 gallons or more waste remaining in them in the sea tank? So uh, since uh, 2003, in the 15-year time frame, um, DOE spent over $830 million wow. in the retrieval at Hanford, uh, <coughs> remote retrieval technology development with a number of different fabricators across the country, both in Richland, Sacramento, Utah. We even worked with a Welsh, uh, Welsh company. Um, We've done a worldwide search of retrieval systems. We've been in close coordination with our sister office at Savannah River on their retrieval operations along with Idaho. There's nothing out there that we were able to find available to retrieve more waste without actually cutting into the tanks and actually what we believe put workers at greater risk um, mm. for getting that hard to retrieve difficult material out of those tanks. Um, so the question is, what would it take? Um, it would take time and money on 74-year-old uh, tanks, and we, we've spent close to a billion dollars on this, and 
We've not been able, we've deployed what we know and what we've been able to find uh, worldwide. Question um, eight, I'm going to ask for one answer head. from the DOE yeah. folks, so I'm not sure who's going to do it, and I do want to hear from ecology, and I know Jeff wants to weigh in on this. What, from each of your perspectives, are the top two remaining risks to human health and the environment resulting from this decision, and how do you propose they be managed? So when we talk about uh, human risk, there's both public health and there's uh, worker risk. The risk to the workers um, are dealing with a tank system that is um, that we understand to be sound right now, but admittedly is 74 years old now. And the mitigating risk to void filling those tanks remains that remains protective of both public health and the worker health and the environment is very important. So um, for the workers themselves, the risk is going into a farm as they are um, with a large void in the ground and monitoring that and plus um, having to deal with any potential in leakage that would come during rainfall events or snow melt events. Um, we believe grouting those tanks would be most protective to those workers. The risk to public health, even though the groundwater, as I said this afternoon, does not have a beneficial use, the groundwater below those tanks is not being uh, consumed. The groundwater is not being used for irrigation right now. Right um, now. Is a particular well, and Jeff had a picture of it um, <coughs> on the south direction. We have one well above drinking water. So it's number of, we have actually three wells above drinking water standards for Technetium 99. And one particular well is 30 times the drinking water standard. So ecology's main uh, perspective on uh, the human health and the environment piece and outlying risks with this weir evaluation really come down to uh, how soils are going to be addressed. And we think that the soils that are underlying the tanks should be included in what the NRC is asked to consult on. Two risks. <clears throat> uh, okay, so first risk for me, this sets a precedent, and this precedent could be applied to the other tank farms at Hanford. Uh, it sets a precedent legally for what the process will be and what the criteria are. Uh, it sets a precedent for how much retrieval is enough. Uh, and you know, this is the first tank farm, and already we couldn't meet the 99% goal there will probably be more difficult tanks down the road. Uh, it also sets a precedent for what makes a good model of the future, and do we have valid assumptions to underpin that model. So precedent setting is risk number one. Risk number two for me is just the unknown. When you choose to leave waste in the environment, you leave behind a question, and DOE wants to make this question permanent, a very long time frame. There are uncertainties in natural systems. We know that there are changes in the climate and we can't quite predict what that's going to do to how moisture regimes work in this region. Uh, we can make guesses. Uh, there are episodic precipitation events that aren't quite captured in the model. There are some natural features in the model. The DOE is approximated, and maybe it was a good approximation, but you know, maybe we'll be wrong. So time tends to surprise us, and nobody is an expert on the future. Uh, so what do, what do we do? How do we manage long-term uncertainty over long time frames? And I find help in three different schools of thought on risk management. The first one is the precautionary principle. And it says, when there is threat of an irreversible harm to an irreplaceable resource, you must act with precaution. To me, that means you go the extra mile when you can. And it means you don't necessarily have to have a causal link between a 
perceived risk and the evidence because you're being precautionary. Um, it also puts the burden of proof on the proponent of an action to prove the absence of harm. And that's one of the criticisms of the questionary principle is it asks you to prove a negative. That's pretty hard to do. Um, the next management philosophy is robustness. So essentially, you be very pessimistic. You try to think about all the things that could go wrong, and then you overbuild. And that is how I would characterize DOE's approach to building this. They have looked at a bunch of different what ifs in their modeling. They're building a nine layer cap when they finish their design. And they're, so they're trying to be immune to change in a way. But the problem is those unknown unknowns. And there's a third philosophy that is about adaptive management. And the idea there is that if actions in, an, in a complex environment are unknowable, then they should be treated like experiments. Mm -hmm. they, we should accept the fact that anything we do to a complex environment is experimental in nature. And therefore, you need to be looking for information, looking for signs that something is different than what you expected. And those errors or those changes can be subtle, and they might not happen for several hundred years. I study adaptive management processes in other natural resource settings, and what I found was that the key to making adaptive management work, ironically, is trust. That mm. you have to all trust one another because you're building a long-term relationship where you're going to look at a problem for a very long time. And you also have to build in a way to, to maneuver if, if surprise happens. What are you gonna do? If find out that you're wrong. And so for me, our comments, my approach to all this is to try to strengthen us in all three ways that you can manage risk. Um, and I guess on the trust, I'll close with the idea that a good process can be a scaffold on which you can build trust. And that's mm -hmm. what all of our comments are asking. Three questions to go. Thanks for your patience, it's been great. So, um, Question nine really does relate to a lot of what Jeff just said. If the tanks are routed, DOE moves forward with closing the tanks. What safeguards and checks and balances will be in place to ensure we don't have unexpected problems in the future? If the updated models later predict the spread of contamination, what are the alternatives at that point with the tank already routed to remedy the situation? Okay, again, this is Sherry Ross. And I think this is an excellent question. Um, we got this question at Savannah Riverside and actually inserted information into the WEIR evaluation to address it. So, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information here. Hopefully it'll help you. The performance assessment, that risk-based analysis that sort of underpins DOE's uh, evaluation, it's one of the major reference documents, um, is a living document. Um, and the, we have a performance assessment maintenance plan where we um, identify activities to maintain that information current to build to help reduce uncertainty. We acknowledge there's uncertainty when you're trying to predict over a long period of time. Um, we also have a monitoring plan. So being informed by your modeling, your predictions, um, or your analysis long term on the risk, where should you be pulling your, your groundwater sample? We're going to have a monitoring plan. Um, so they're all living documents that are required to be updated on a regular basis uh, to consider new information. We may actually identify, we will pull actual soils from the data that's done underneath these tanks and, uh, and test them to see how certain radioclides may behave to that soil column. Um, those kinds of research activities to help reduce uncertainty and maintain your documents and information current. So we annually evaluate that information to ensure that our performance assessment is, is adequate. So, um, and we will also take uh, necessary actions to ensure the protective standards uh, and performance objectives are being met. Uh, changes to barriers such as closure caps, um, remedial technologies, uh, can be deployed subsequent to closing these tanks to provide additional barriers and protection to ensure these objectives are met. So um, that is something that we do across our DOE sites. Um, annual site evaluation reports um, are typically published. Uh, monitoring reports are typically required 
be provided to our regulators, uh, such as the state of Washington. Um, periodic inspections uh, may be decided. Uh, these activities are normally specified in the, um, the site-specific um, closure plans with the state um, regulatory agencies, and those are typically published. Um, so we do take, take um, seriously the monitoring and long-term maintenance <coughs> of our risk analysis and provide updates. And again, additional <coughs> actions, protective measures can be taken if we identify that oh, we were just wrong about certain parameters or we are seeing more contaminants in the groundwater, then we can take additional protective actions to, to address that. Question 10 is for ecology. As uh, we mentioned in an earlier question and in Jeff's presentation, there's still more than 10,000 gallons of waste remaining in three of the sea farm tanks, lesser amounts remaining in all of them. Ecology's perspective is DOE retrieved enough waste from the sea farm tanks to meet their legal obligations. So the answer to the question is yes. Ecology has settled with DOE on the consent decree. Uh, that required the deployment of up to three technologies for retrievals. That being said, closure of sea farms still requires a uh, signed closure plan by the Department of Ecology. So all of that will ultimately be considered before any closure decision is made. Okay. The last question we have before we open it up for you folks, kind of came out of left field uh, for a lot of us. Uh, about a week and a half ago, and some of you may not have heard about this, DOE released a notice for public comment that DOE has chosen to reinterpret the definition of high-level waste. By our initial review, it appears that DOE would create a whole new administrative pathway for saying waste is not high-level, and this new pathway removes two of the key requirements in the WIRA criteria that Jeff talked about. Namely, it would delete the requirement to remove key radionuclides to the maximum extent practical, and the requirement that waste be incorporated in a solid physical form that meets Class C low-level waste uh, concentrations. So why is DOE now releasing this new interpretation of high-level waste definition, and what would this mean for the tank farm closure that we're talking about here tonight and future tank closures in the future? Excellent question. Um, so the department has an obligation to continually look at um, the effective managing management of our waste. Um, the department is seeking public comment on its interpretation of the statutory term high-level radioactive waste and what is not high-level waste through the Federal Register notice. Um, I do believe, do we have comments? We had com copies. Here. We have so we do have copies um, outside of this Federal Register notice that department is asking for comments on if you'd like to obtain a copy. Um, at, this this, at this time, the department is not making and has not made any decisions on the classification or disposal of any particular waste stream across the UV complex. Uh, no implementation actions will be taken without appropriate interaction.